We're good? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all here this evening. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Professor Ross Brand, in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I have a few thank yous. One is I want to thank the friends of Jewish Lifelong Learning who've supported this lecture and so much of what we do here. And I also want to thank the AJS, the Association of Jewish Studies. We have a wonderful partnership with them, and it's really through them that we've had Professor Brand come to be with us here and to thank Professor Brand for partnering with them uh, to help support their great work. Uh, in terms of upcoming programs, we have a few upcoming lectures in one in April, a few in May. I have flyers distributed on your seat so you can take a look to see what interests you. And more immediately, I want to tell you about a class that we're going to be running here that starts next week on Thursday evenings. It runs on Thursday evenings. It's on Jewish food and eating. I thought it would be appropriate right before Pesach to have that class, Ethics, Laws, and Customs, really about Jewish food ways. And that will be taught by our own Kyla Schneider. We're really excited to have her teaching for us this season. And the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is Eshkol Nevo, who's an acclaimed Israeli author, has been translated into many languages, including English, prolific, very interesting commentary on contemporary Israeli life, will be coming here from Israel next week, April 4th. Yeah, he'll be here April 4th and 5th doing a series of lectures. And um, if you haven't read his stuff, I encourage you to look it up on the web, but you're definitely welcome to come hear him speak. I have not met him yet myself, but I've heard really wonderful things about him, and I'm really excited to be hosting him. So with that, I want to turn my attention to our guest of the evening, Professor Ross Bran, who comes to us from the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University, where he's been since 1986. He serves there as the Milton R. Convitz Professor of Judeo-Islamic Studies and Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellow. Professor Brand studied at the University of California in Berkeley, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, at New York University, and at the American University in Cairo. He's received fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Center for Advanced Judaic Studies of the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Brand is the author of The Compunctious Poet, Cultural Ambiguity and Hebrew Poetry in Muslim Spain, and Power in the Portrayal, Representatives of Muslims and Jews in Islamic Spain, along with many other articles and edited scholarly volumes. And we're so happy to have you here with us. Uh, please give Professor Brandt a warm Cleveland welcome. Thank you. On? Yes. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cooper and Sheila for making this visit possible and very comfortable for me. Uh, there are times in the year when almost any invitation to leave Ithaca will meet with my approval. Um, and this isn't necessarily one of them, but um, I've been in this neck of the woods before uh, doing some teaching at Oberlin, one of your neighbors, and uh, I'm really glad to be able to be here this evening. Um, so one of the occupational hazards of looking like me, uh, bespectacled, balding, uh, Mediterranean-looking person is I get stopped at a lot of airports, and also even in baseball stadiums with people thinking that I'm someone else. Uh, you definitely, if you're me, because I travel a lot in the Middle East, don't want to be mistaken for Salman Rushdie, the author, but I have been, and you could see why. Um, I've had people accost me 
asking for my autograph when I wear a baseball hat and my sunglasses are on. People somehow think I look like Steven Spielberg. Uh, needless to say, college professors, although we're well taken care of by our respective academic institutions, are not in the class of Steven Spielberg. And uh, there are a bunch of other people that I look like too, according to my sons or other people, uh, even in popular culture. Uh, here is uh, from long ago in New York City, where I was teaching in a Hebrew high school in the afternoon. And I created a course called Greet the Greats, which each week I would dress up go down to uh, 42nd Street area and buy theatrical makeup and costumes and things. It's completely out of my mind as a graduate student. And dress up as an important or not so important figure in Jewish history. One of the people that I'll be talking about in passing is this character that I was impersonating that day. Let me begin with the folktale. Folktale tells the story of two neighbors whose adjacent fields were separated by a wall. One side of the wall was painted black. The other side of the wall was painted white. One day, both neighbors were tending to their respective fields when one shouted, the wall is white. The other neighbor shouted back, no, the wall is black. In the end, a fight broke out, and the two neighbors killed one another. Neither of them thought to look at the other side of the wall. Now, I often use that folktale to introduce mostly courses that I teach on the modern Middle East, especially on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, but it has a certain resonance for what I'm going to be talking about this evening, because in our world today, there are people, certainly not those who take advantage of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Institute, but others who seem to think that the struggle between Jews and Muslims in the Middle East, between Israelis and Palestinians or Israelis and Arabs today, somehow goes back to some primordial battle between Ishmael and Isaac, and that they've always done nothing but fight with one another. And what we are living through is simply more of the same. It's preordained, it's destined, and there's simply no way out. The historian can't accept such arguments without going back to the sources, without investigating whether or not this was always true in all times and in all places. So, so we're going to take a little survey of some of those times and places, namely the age of classical Islam, roughly from the 7th century to the 12th century um, to test the hypothesis. And we're going to see that uh, it's a bent hypothesis. It's an exaggeration. And that life as people lived it and experienced it in the Middle Ages, Jews and Muslims, it was far more complex than being able to reduce it to some kind of pre-existent, preordained conflict that was going to last from its inception uh, in pre-biblical Israel, in uh, pre-biblical ancient Near East, down to the modern Middle East today. So I'm going to try to do this fairly informally. I wanted to come down here because you're a convivial group, uh, but the, the, the tech will not permit it. But I'm going to try to do this as if we were in, in a classroom. We'll come back to this map a number of times, but here you can see all of the places in the Islamic world where the Jews lived. And during the age that we're going to be talking about this evening, this is where, in spite of the fact that in the United States, the overwhelming majority of American Jews come from Ashkenazi backgrounds, around the year 1000, at least up until the year 1000, and maybe even a little longer, the overwhelming majority of Jews in the world lived in Middle Eastern lands under Islam that the Jewish people did not become a principally Ashkenazi people, always with Jewish communities living elsewhere, but with the bulk of Jews of Central and Eastern European background, this did not happen until later on in the Middle Ages. During the period in which we're going to be talking about the most important, most productive, and wealthiest Jewish communities in the world resided in these lands 
outlined in purple in the Islamic world. And that's an important thing that we'll come back to shortly. Now let me just give you a couple of terms of reference to help you understand how I'm going to be talking about Islam in three different ways. There is Islam the religion, of course, without which none of the rest of it would make any sense. And very often, what Jews had to say, what they thought, what they experienced about Islam the religion differed from their experience of other aspects of their encounter with that world in which they were uh, embedded. When we speak about the polity of Islam, the empire, the state, we tend to today use the term Islamdom, a kind of a parallel to Christendom. So Jews living in two of the great areas of the world in the pre-modern period, Christendom, where Christianity was the majoritarian religion, and Islamdom, where Islam was the majoritarian religion. But in both cases, where we use that word to indicate a polity. And as with the religion, Jewish attitudes towards and the experience of the polity of Islam may vary over time and place and may be fundamentally different from perceptions or sensibilities regarding the religion itself. And finally, Islamic civilization, with the door thrown widely open, and I think you can understand that since a majority of the Jews of the world lived in that realm and participated in it, speaking mostly Arabic, but farther to the east, Persian, in this entire realm, all the way up to the border with Iran, Arabic was the spoken language of Jews and the language of their culture, even their religious culture. And of course, when you go east, you're getting into Iran and Persian, and that carried into Central Asia. So we're going to be talking about Jews and Islam in three different respects. Let's begin with an observation by a very important Jew living in Cordoba as the head of the Jewish community in Spain in the 10th century, offering a comment about his view of the Jewish experience of the Islamic polity of the state of Islam. He wrote in a letter to uh, a Jewish uh, interlocutor in the Caucasus, when God, God saw the Jews' affliction and toil, he exerted his influence and put me before the king, the Muslim king, and was graceful to me so that he drew his attention to me because of his kindness and for the sake of his alliance, and not because of my merit. We indeed, who are of the remnant of captive Israelites, servants of my lord the king, are dwelling peacefully in the land of our sojourning. This text is not ambivalent about the place of the Jews in an Islamic polity in 10th century Cordoba, where this very, very prominent Jewish figure and head of the Jewish community, who was both a court physician and a scientist and a patron of various things in the Jewish community, of lifelong learning, we could say, uh, and other aspects of research is conveying that there is security and uh, we would say tolerance today and acceptance of the fact that the Jews, a relatively small people, nevertheless have a rootedness and a place in this part of the Islamic polity and yet it's a land of their sojourning, that there is a longing for a return to the land of Israel in some distant or near messianic age, but in the meantime, things are looking pretty good for this community. A Jew from the same place, born in the same place, born in Cordoba, who is much more famous than Chas and Chabrut. Moses Maimonides, in 1172, gave pastoral counseling to the Jews of Yemen who were being subject to a period of extended persecution by the Yemeni Islamic State at the time. And Maimonides, in his pastoral role, offered various strategies to that community that turned to him for how are they going to get through this period of travail and tribulation. And he wrote to them, You know, my brethren, that on account of sins, God has cast us into the midst of this people, the nation of Ishmael, who persecute us severely, 
No nation has ever done more harm to Israel. None has matched it in debasing and humiliating us. On the one hand, two texts separated by less than 200 years from this, within the same linguistic orbit, the same religious orbit, the same civilizational orbit, not exactly the same polity, because by this time Islam was separated into different polities, but we see the distinction that in the one case, Jews are persecuted. In the other case, Jews are said to be more than tolerated, but to have a real secure existence in a place, and they're accepted. So to turn for the moment from civilization to another, from polity to culture, to civilization, um, and this will help us in everything else we'll learn about civilization this evening. A poet going back to Spain, but someone who traversed the Jewish world in a time when travel was not as easy as it is today. And yet people traveled widely. It's astonishing what we know about how Jews and non-Jews went from west to east and east to west over the ages, mostly for business, but also for learning, sometimes for wanderlust, sometimes for uh, job opportunities. Uh, this young man, Dunash Ben Labrat, who was born in Fez, moved to Baghdad, all the way on the eastern side of my map, and then all the way back to Cordoba, where he stayed in the 10th century, and worked as a court poet for Hastai ibn Chaprut, the man whose letter I read from just a few minutes ago. Dunash wrote what I like to call a napkin poem. It's a ditty. He thought of this. He was at some soiree, uh, probably having a nice glass of wine, maybe listening to the birds singing in the orange trees to the trickle of water, enjoying convivial company, reciting poetry and discussing philosophy and Jewish law. And this thought came to him and he jotted it down on a little piece of paper. That's why it's only a two-liner in Hebrew. He wrote, let scripture be your Eden and the Arabs' books your paradise grove. Incredible. Here he captures the essence of what cultural life was like for the Jews in most Islamic lands during the entire period I'm talking about. That on the one hand, they were very conscious of their identity as Jews and deeply, devoutly connected to Jewish observance and Jewish learning that they had inherited, Hebrew scripture, while at the same time deeply, deeply immersed in their cultural surroundings to their benefit through their encounter with the Arabic language and their absorbing of Arabic as their everyday in their everyday speech and in some of their literature. And you see a nice balance here between the first half of the verse and the second half of the verse, both of which are essential, both of which the sum total of learning, scripture I hear is to be taken as all of Torah, is your entrance to the Garden of Eden and books written by the Arabs or the Muslims, they are your paradise, which is a sin for evil. So we like to talk about the Jews of this period as living in two worlds at once, a traditional Jewish universe, while at the same time, full participants economically, culturally, and even socially in the wider Islamic society. But, and here we come back to an observation that both is important for our cultural uh, view, but the political and even the religious view at the same time. The Islamic world, like Christendom, for the Jews living in that domain, is huge. The Jews were always a small people. Even before they were dispersed, they were a small people. And even in places in the Islamic world, like Fez and Cordoba and Cairo and Baghdad, where there were very, very substantial, significant, and enterprising Jewish communities, they were a small minority of the population.
Their strength was never in their numbers. Here is a view of an interior of a building that still stands, thankfully was not torn down when uh, the Christians in Spain retook Cordoba from the Muslims in 1236. They let most of the mosques stand. Those of you who've been to Spain know what I'm talking about. It's a huge complex. It's like bigger than Macy's in New York City. It's humongous. Maybe not even a 10-minute walk from that great mosque of Cordoba is a synagogue that dates from several centuries later, but its scale tells you in the Jewish quarter the difference between the majoritarian culture and religion and their numbers in society and the Jews who were a small minority. Even if there were 10, 15 synagogues of this size, and there were, they're tiny. They're one room, not even this space, uh, which is sobering. And when I take both adult and student groups on study tours of these places, I ask them to come to that realization, that from the narrow perspective of Jewish life as it's lived today, wherever Jews live, there's this sense that, you know, this people is all over the place and has left its imprint. And yes, even the Spanish and other states market Jewish tours and so on and so forth. But it was always very, very tiny. And yet, this period, from especially 800 to 1200, left a lasting imprint on all of Jewish life, not just Jewish life in the lands of the Mediterranean under Islam, but developments that uh, pertain to Jewish life during those 400 years under Islam were bequeathed to Jewish existence even beyond the borders of the Islamic world. This was the period in which the Jewish people were transformed in the post-Talmudic age from an agrarian people mostly living on the land into an urban people living mostly in cities and larger towns. Now I realize it was a bit more complex in Eastern Europe, but in the main, certainly in Central and Western Europe, and even in parts of Eastern Europe, like Kiev and Odessa, Jews ultimately became associated with urban life and with urban professions, and with the kind of learning and cultural vistas that you associate with urbanity, as opposed to living off of the land. That socioeconomic transformation took place under classical Islam. And it took place under classical Islam because while Islam most decidedly ruled its polity, first and foremost for Muslims, secondarily for Christians, Jews, and other minorities who had a second-class status. But in socioeconomic matters, the government did not interfere whatsoever. And it, their economic outlook look was laissez-faire. That as long as taxes are collected and the peace is kept, it doesn't matter what your religion is or what your community is, or what your historical outlook is, you are free to come and go in all of your commercial affairs. There were no ghettos. Jews lived in apartments alongside Muslims and Christians in places like Egypt, uh, and in Syria, in Damascus, and in Baghdad, and in Cordoba. No Christians in Morocco at the time, but living and working and uh, along with urbanization was Arabization, the complete transformation of Jews from Aramaic, a sister language to Hebrew. Those of you who attend synagogue will know at least some Aramaic from the Kol Nidre prayer we recite on the eve of Yom Kippur, and probably more uh, familiar would be the Kaddish, which is not written in Hebrew in any of its varieties, but in the language of the rabbis, which was Aramaic. Aramaic, Hebrew, and Arabic are sister languages, like Spanish, French, and Italian. And so the Jewish transition 
wherever the Jews were living, from Aramaic uh, to Arabic, was an, a transition of ease rather than one of where do I go to sign up for my Berlitz class? Or I saw that there's a Hebrew class going around the corner. Where do I go for my adult ed Arabic lessons? You didn't have to do that. It was not so foreign. It was close and easily learned. So Arabization, urbanization, economic freedom, centralization of Jewish communal authority in central institutions of learning and law and lore, and the systematization of all Jewish activities of a literary, religious, intellectual nature. Just really, really quickly, today we take for granted that uh, if you study biblical Hebrew, you can go and read a grammar book. There was no such thing as systematic Hebrew grammar until the Jews learned grammar because the Arabs wrote grammar about Quranic Jews grammars in Arabic about the uh, behavior of biblical Hebrew. They also composed the first biblical Hebrew dictionaries, so Hebrew lexicography. Again, first and foremost, they wrote biblical Hebrew dictionaries in Arabic, explaining what words meant. The first line-by-line -line commentaries on the text of the Hebrew Bible. I don't know, for those of you who attend synagogue, whether you're still using the Hertz or whether you're using the new JPS, but you know you have an apparatus there to look if there's a question about the text. Um, that did not exist in any form uh, in a line-by-line -line rational way until the Islamic age. Again, because Muslims were writing commentaries on the Quran, Jews began to write linear commentaries on the text of the Hebrew Bible. We've already seen one very brief example of Hebrew poetry uh, that came in two varieties, one social, that was a social poem, but a much larger variety were poems written for recitation in the synagogue service, many of which are still used in various liturgical rites today. Law codes, systematizing Jewish law, for everyone in an accessible way if you didn't have time to study the Talmud. And responsa, where if you had a query and your rabbi in town didn't know the answer, you could send a message to important rabbinical scholars in Baghdad or Cairo or Cordoba and get an answer back in the mail. Again, paralleling a model in Islam. I want to come back to polity. The Jewish encounter with Islam was profound. And in Palestine, from which this apocalyptic poem comes in the seventh century, the coming of Islam was remembered, if not actually experienced, by the Jews of Byzantine Palestine as a divinely mandated liberation. In Byzantine Palestine, Jews were forbidden from residence in the holy city of Jerusalem when it was in Christian hands. The arrival of Islam and the army of Islam in the seventh century, as far as Jewish history and Jewish memory goes, liberated the city in the name of Islam, but with the Jews benefiting in that suddenly Jewish access to Jerusalem was opened again. It did not disturb the Muslims that a small Jewish minority would desire to reacquaint itself with the Jews' holy city. So we have texts like the one that you're looking at above uh, that speak to that conquest, that Islam is fulfilling a divine role in the history of the Jewish people. Quite remarkable when you think about that in light of the world that we live in today. But that's not all. When the Muslims arrived a little bit later in Jerusalem itself and began to clear out the Temple Mount, they found that the Byzantine Christians had turned it into a refuse heap of rubble, the Holy Temple, as a sign of Christianity having superseded Judaism, and as a sign of the Jews' shame and Christians' superiority. The sources that we have, and again, we have no way of knowing if these happened exactly as the text described them, 
But maybe more important is that this is the memory. What we do know is that the city was reopened to the Jews. And here you have a text in which the caliph of Islam, the head of the polity, needs expert guidance when he arrives in Jerusalem. Where do I go? Where was the temple? Where was the holiest of holies? And how do I orient a building to reflect that holiness? Because I would like to erect a new building on this site. Who does he go to get this information? Who are his expert informants? The Jews, because they are the guardians of the traditions of monotheism in Jerusalem. So you have a range of texts authored by both Jews and Muslims from the Middle Ages, like this account of the Caliph Omar arriving in Jerusalem and kind of cutting a deal with the Jews. You help me, I help you. You help me identify the proper place to put a, mo a monument here for Islam, and I will uh, open the city up to you. That's essentially what that text says. The Caliph Abd al-Malik crafted this building, which stands today. Um, I like to sort of, sort of put this out there uh, when I'm giving one-shot talks on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but also in uh, uh, when I'm talking about the Middle Ages. This building was not built by Palestinians in the 20th century to sort of make sure they get their two cents claims in on the city of Jerusalem in general and the Holy Mount, the Temple Mount in particular. This place was inherently sacred to Muslims and Christians and Jews because from the point of view of comparative religion, at least as we teach it in American universities, certainly not in all madrasas, yeshivot, or uh, Bible seminaries, but from the point of view of comparative religion, Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship the same monotheistic deity. Their religious traditions overlap a great deal, even as they differ in some of the details and certainly in their sense of history. But the rock under that dome thought to be sacred to Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It is thought, according to Jewish tradition, to be the place where Abraham very nearly sacrificed his second son, Isaac. In Islamic tradition, it's the place from which Muhammad is believed to have ascended to the seventh heavens and had his interview with Moses, Jesus, and the other prophets in a miraculous night journey. So the dome is over that rock, but it's on a spot that is inherently sacred. This is shared sacred history that cannot be unraveled because, as we'll see in a moment, the interconnection between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is too strong, and their claims are certainly claims of rivals over this story, but uh, if they only had the good sense to study their own traditions historically, they would come to understand why that's so. And it's because they all claim the same sacred history and worship the same deity. And here you see the Temple Mount. The first chapter of the Quran. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, Lord of the universe the compassionate, the merciful, sovereign of the day of judgment. You alone we worship, and to you alone we turn for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those you have favored, not of those who have incurred your wrath, nor of those who have gone astray. In Islam, this is like a Muslim's catechism. It's a little bit like the Shema Yisrael for Judaism. Is there anything in this text that is incompatible with Judaism or Christianity for that matter. There isn't. It's a statement of pure monotheism, that God is the master of the universe, or the sovereign of the universe, I prefer to say, and uh, that God judges people's behavior and rewards and punishes accordingly on Judgment Day. The Arabic is Yawm Din, which is just like the Hebrew Yom Hadin. Could you imagine a Jew trying to learn Arabic, and then hearing these words, and they're more than cognates. It's the same word with a slightly different pronunciation. In fact, the entire phrase, Maliki Yom Hadin, the sovereign of the Day of Judgment, is Melech Yom Hadin in Hebrew. 
it sounded familiar because it is familiar. It is rooted in the same monotheistic idea. Chapter 2 of the Quran also, we see utterances that are familiar and different at the same time. Uh, accepting what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes. The Banu Israel, the Israelites, are mentioned scores of times in the text of the Quran. In another occasion, I could teach you about that. Anyone opening the book would find a great deal that's familiar and also a great deal that's not familiar. Believers, Jews, Christians, and Sabaeans, whoever believes in God in the last day and does what is right, shall be rewarded by their Lord. They have nothing to fear or regret. Again, a allowance of the plurality of monotheistic belief already in the text of the Quran. But there's also contested sacred history where Islam turns polemical. Abraham was neither Jew nor Christian. He was an upright man, one who surrendered himself to God. And the word for surrendering himself to God here is Muslim, with a small m. So we find already in classical Islam an ambivalence and an ambiguity that is open and extended on the one hand, but polemical on the other. So you have this intimacy and rivalry built into the very fabric of the Jews' encounter with the religion and vice versa for the Muslims. Um, I'm going to skip this one, but uh, you could take a quick look at it. Hebron, even more than Jerusalem, is probably the worst flashpoint in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at this moment in time. And we have another one of these texts, I have lots of them, where the Jews are helping the Muslims in Hebron because they've just arrived and they want to know about the cave of the patriarchs. Unimaginable when you read this text in light of the world we live in today. So if I could bang some heads together and teach this course to people who would need to hear it, uh, I'm armed, but I've not been invited. We have a whole host of other texts from the Middle Ages. Later on, in, uh, that are midrashic in this case, or esoteric in this case, or a commentary in another case, where later developments as well, Jewish authors attribute a hand of God for their benefit to having brought Islam and Islamic rule to Middle Eastern lands where most of the Jews live. And uh, because their second class status under the Christians, under the Byzantines, as the only religious minority, was fraught with danger. As one of two, or even more if you count the Zoroastrians, religious minorities under Islam, the picture was much better for the Jews. And of course, their smallness, as opposed to the number of Christians, meant that they represented no threat to the Muslims. And this is why. These various accounts of how Jews are assisting Muslims and Muslims are assisting Jews in the classical age of Islam, they ha they have, they, they, there is a practical uh, reality to them because Muslims could not fear that some Jewish army from outside the borders of Islamdom might show up and the Jews be in cahoots with them, as might have been the case with Christians living in the lands of Islam. But, because I want to keep things here neatly messy, we have a whole host of texts by Jewish authorities during this period, generally midrashic and liturgical, meaning very, very uh, religiously oriented texts where Jews, important Jews, write about the sadness that comes with being in exile and of being subject to these forces of these great empires, and especially Haiga'on is before the time of the Crusades, which begin in 1099, but especially after 1099, we have a plethora of texts written by Jews in which they take note of the idea that the world, that it's, it's like the United States and the Soviet Union. You have Islamdom and Christendom, and they're battling for world supremacy in Spain and in the Holy Land, and the Jews are kind of, nowhere, with no prospects until the Messiah comes. And for Jews who thought about that historical situation, 
that was very often uncomfortable, and they sought an end to it, even if life in exile, in its specifics at that time and place, was really tolerable, or even better than tolerable. And so you see like this. This is the people that never were, eaten away, scattered, despoiled. Babylonia tranced them, Medea knocked them out, Greece swallowed them, Islam did not vomit them. Why make their yoke heavier? Why double their misery? Powerless, what can they endure? This is a liturgical prayer to God to end the exile. So we have uh, all the while that this other stuff is going on, and very often authored by the same people. The same people. These notes of sadness and despair and anticipation for the messianic age, at the same time as you have literary creativity and intellectual creativity and a vibrant economic life in which Jews are overrepresented in the middle and upper middle classes and involved in trading networks, all accident in the Indian Ocean. He was supporting the family in the, a very, very lucrative Indian Ocean trade. And Maimonides himself, probably the greatest Jewish rabbinic figure and greatest Jewish thinker of the ever, maybe. Um, some people would debate that, but it's at least arguable. Um, writes in a personal letter how he fell into a deep depression for a year. He was a physician, too, uh, after his brother, his younger brother David, in the Indian Ocean, and that he found himself having to care for David's children, and he found himself having to abandon some of his medical and philosophical and rabbinic studies and basically go back to work as a court physician to support a greater extended family in the absence of this younger brother's economic enterprise. Much of that that I'm describing, by the way, didn't have time to develop this fully, we know in far greater detail than we did 50 or 100 years ago because of the discovery of the Cairo Geniza, which I hope you've at least heard about. But it basically was a treasure trove of manuscripts and personal letters and economic documents and literary materials stashed away in a storeroom of a synagogue in Old Cairo. I don't recommend going there anytime soon, but hopefully, God willing, Egypt will calm down and, and you can go and you can visit it. It's a nice museum now. And see, it's right by the Coptic Museum in Old Cairo. And all of those documents are now in the pro have been in the process of, of being studied by scholars, and they include documents discovered in Maimonides' own handwriting. Not just documents about him or things that people copied of his later on, but what we call autographs. And we have autographs of a host of other very prominent Jewish figures from this same period as well giving us a glimpse of their inner lives and their economic life and marital life uh, and uh, children and just or the Jewish history of that age was as profound a discovery as the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was for the study of uh, late Second Temple Judaism and early Christianity. We're coming to a close, and then we'll have some discussion. I mentioned that character that I was dressed up as. He was a gentleman called, or maybe not such a gentleman, called Judah al-Harizi, who was born in Toledo in Iberia and died in Aleppo in Syria in 1225. Look at this poem, written in perfect biblical Hebrew. Now, he's not exactly a bohemian poet. This is not Greenwich Village. He is a fully observant rabbinic Jew who also likes to fool around with the Hebrew language and have fun with literature because this is what you do when you're educated and uh, well-versed in Arabic poetry that likes to write about this kind of stuff as well. If Moses had seen my friend drinking his wine when the flesh came on, 
His beauty and curls would have compelled them to cancel the Torah's law about lying with men. Now, this is an as if. He's playing around here. He's having fun. Uh, it's, there's wine. There's masculine beauty. And he's using a rhetorical trick that all poets know, which is to get the audience to follow along with this little imaginative exercise by picking like the most pious Jew of all time, the one, responsi the one responsible for writing down the Torah at Mount Sinai, if Moses himself could have seen how beautiful that young man is, he would have taken white out to the Torah, to that line of the Torah. Um, this is all, of course, tongue-in-cheek, but it bespeaks of a culture that is enamored with the beauty of the word, the beauty of nature, the beauty of human beings, of whatever gender, and the pleasure that comes with being able to appreciate beauty and demonstrating your appreciation for beauty through beautiful literature in beautiful biblical Hebrew. I have lots of poems like that. Finally, back to my friend Maimonides. This is a, we don't really know what he looks like other than that he probably did wear a turban and most certainly had a beard. But this is a statue of him that you find very close to that little synagogue I showed you in Cordoba. He wrote, and as for the Arabic and Hebrew languages, all who know both of them are agreed that they are one language without a doubt. This observation captures, maybe even better than that last poem, or any of the other mini texts that we were looking at, the proximity, the intimacy of Jewish life in the lens of classical Islam uh, as experienced by not just average people because of their trading and working and living, but among the most learned classes and those responsible for the well-being of their community, like Maimonides, and his, his heirs, who were basically the chief rabbis of Egypt for several generations, and also the uh, political leaders of the Jewish community in Cairo, responsible for the well-being of the Jewish community and representing it to the Muslim authorities. Mus Muslim physicians and intellectuals Maimonides is profoundly engaged in during his, all of his years of life. And yet, he was the one, you'll recall, earlier in 1172, who was able to write words of encouragement, a pastoral letter to the Jews of Yemen at a moment of their tremendous desperation and despair that were seemingly hostile to Islamdom. So what have we learned? We've learned that we cannot reduce, in the universities today, we use a fancy word for this. It's called essentializing. We can't in one sentence or even in one paragraph say the Jewish encounter with Islam is X. It won't do. Now, I realize that my, in my profession and in my classroom and in my work, uh, I'm kind of paid to make things more complex when maybe they actually are more simple. That's what I do. I'm at this point, traveling in this part of the world, studying part of the world, uh, particularly in the classical age of Islam. What we have learned, what I've tried to convey to you is that during this period, it was a profoundly complex a dynamic, a transformative period of which, in which the Jews were decidedly still living in exile and aware of that fact and not uh, just from time to time anxious for that exile to come to an end. And yet, in the meantime, taking full advantage of every opportunity that they were given and fully integrating themselves into the social, economic, and cultural life of their surroundings. Not in some ways unlike the American Jewish community today. Thanks.
I'm going to take questions. Yes. You said not unlike the American Jewish community today, which is in the midst of a reduction of its numbers. That's true. In what way did they maintain their numbers? Uh, with difficulty. There were many converts, some intellectual converts, others who converted out of convenience um, or for uh, economic opportunity. And yet the cohesion, uh, it's, it's a kind of an odd thing because I was just, uh, I was just talking to Dr. Cooper about this earlier. The Jewish community during this period had its own inner squabbles, debates, uh, fractures, uh, sometimes extended that went on for years with different authorities disagreeing profoundly, excommunications, horrible disputes. And yet they somehow uh, came out the other side of them, even in spite of their much smaller numbers. Their numbers relative to the overall population probably were less than the number of American Jews today, which is about, I think, 1.5% of the entire American public. We think that the Jewish population in this part of the world was probably about 1%. But in big cities, it might have been around 5 and maybe even a little bit more than that, just like here, just like here. So that in certain parts of Cleveland, that I drove through, you could, if that's all you saw, you would get the impression, oh, the Jews are a minority. No, they're a majority. They're all over the place here. They own all the buildings and look at all their places of worship. That would be misleading in terms of a much larger picture. But in, in, a, in a smaller picture, you, what, what you're seeing is a, a kind of an imprint that's not entirely unlike what prevailed during this particular period. And the numbers, um, this is not going to make you feel any better because you've noticed a decline and you're reading the surveys. But this is not uncommon in Jewish And as I said, if you just accept and embrace the fact that the vitality of Jewish history was never dependent on how many Jews there were, then maybe that'll leave you just a little bit more optimistic. And then I'll have done my job. So the answer to this question is probably another lecture. But can you tell us when it all started going wrong, the relationship between Muslims and Jews? Yeah. So it is, it's several lectures, actually. And especially, I mean, you probably know if you've come and heard other speakers, our professional uh, hazard is uh, we talk too much. We talk too long. Um, and that's, that's, it's always a, a struggle for me to try to hold back and say that that's the topic for another evening. But this is obviously an important question. So there, there's a, it's a two-part answer. I would say those of you who are, I, I think you've been talking with some people about the, the Jewish experience in the Ottoman Empire and how that in a way, it's much later, it's not the classical Islamic period, but it was one in which Jews were welcomed and given refuge and, and, uh, um, and opportunity in, in that exile, uh, principally from Spain and Portugal, um, that lasted several hundred years. So this, in my view, is a modern phenomenon, what you're pointing to. And uh, it, it has two beginnings, one in North Africa, when the French, uh, after they began to occupy North Africa, sought ways to divide and rule Jews from Muslims. And they uh, created and encouraged Jews to stop attending schools where they would learn Arabic, their own schools, and instead would go to Alliance schools and to turn them into French speakers. And the end result of that process was to mislead the, Jew, the North African Jews' Muslim counterparts that the Jews were not rooted in those countries but were themselves European. They were looking to France. They were part of the colonial power structure. So that's, 
the first part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, of course, modern Zionism. And that doesn't really begin until 1881. Um, that Jewish claims to the land of Israel, in whatever way, shape, or form that took, were bound to clash with the Arabs who were living there. And in 1917, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. In 1917, there were 85,000 Jews and 608,000 Palestinian Arabs living in the Holy Land, living in the land of Israel. And of course, the 20th century changed that demography, and there were political consequences, um, which are terribly unfortunate. So in some ways, the second, the first part of my answer, which is getting very long-winded now, I realize, was avoidable. The second probably was unavoidable. Toward the beginning of your talk, you mentioned were there certain careers that were close to them that propelled this transition? No, it was, it was the opposite, that the opening of economic opportunity in the cities created a ho whole new enterprises for Jews. And then they also very wisely took advantage of the fact that they could engage in, they did have business partnerships with Muslims, but they could also take advantage of networks of Jewish traders in other countries in the Mediterranean that they could rely on. So there were great banking houses and great merchant houses with, um, with parties, say, say your business is based in Baghdad, but you have representatives, local Egyptian representatives in the Jewish community in Cairo and in Alexandria and in Cairo and in Tunisia and in Fez in Morocco and in Cordoba in Spain. And that network only grows your your business and your wealth, and therefore your standing in your community. So it was the opening up of, there was a mercantile revolution under Islam, is the other way of saying this. And the Jews, along with everybody else, benefited that, benefited from it. You could, you could make the argument, and some do, that the Jews benefited disproportionately. They took real advantage of this opportunity. This, when it's, there's no parallel to economic life of Jews in the lands of Islam with Jewish economic life in Christendom, where there were all kinds of restrictions on everything that pushed Jews into money lending, which also had social and uh, political consequences for them. You mentioned the Quran um, as many things that are very um, biblical, but there are also uh, certain areas where they diverge. Um, <clears throat> uh, the debates and, uh, and um, uh, the terrible kinds of conflicts between Jews and Christians about reading what the, um, the Bible, the Old Testament to Christians, um, did any of that take place under Islam, where Jews and Muslims debated issues in which their, their holy acts diverged? That's a great diverged. question. They actually did, um, usually with rules to protect the minority, um, who would naturally be reluctant, usually in elite intellectual circles, where everyone understood that certain kinds of arguments couldn't be used. So, but this is in rarefied academic environments. People like Moses Maimonides, we have evidence, engaged in such discussions, not even necessarily debates. This is not like the disputations that took place, say, beginning in 13th century Spain and then spread to France and other European lands where Jewish leaders were summoned and what they could and couldn't say about Christianity was restricted. And if things went sour in the disputation, the Jewish community must suffer. We don't have any. The main reason why we don't have anything like that is that Islam was confident in its rightness and not 
worried that this small Jewish community, uh, in spite of its own pride in its heritage, um, it represented no threat to Islam. So you don't sweat it. There is inherent in the Jewish-Christian relationship in the pre-modern age a tension between Christianity, Christendom wanting to keep the Jews around as a reminder of the message of Christ and what happens when you don't embrace it. But then the other side of that is Christians getting the idea that uh, those who, at least according to some reading of New Testament texts, may have had a hand in Christ's death, uh, ought to be punished even further than they already have by it, for it. Um, you don't have anything like that in Islam. So that dynamic is different. Yes. Periodically for a right. To that. Exactly. So, well, there is, but not exactly. There's a little echo of it in the Quran, but it's it's, and wherever Jews are into trouble, but it's not like Muslims are sitting around, you know, thinking about this and contemplating it to no end. But when Jews and Muslims find themselves in trouble, you can find extremist voices who point to this. It goes back to the very beginnings of Islam. One view of what happened with the Prophet Muhammad is that when he went to Medina from Mecca, he encountered three large Jewish tribal confederations. He may well have thought that they would accept him as a prophet. He did, we have a document, again it's historicity I'm not sure about, but people remember it as having a historical validity, in which the Prophet Muhammad enters into a treaty with the Jewish tribes in Medina. And he says, to you, your religion, to me, mine. That they can continue their Judaism, but they're allies. Two of the tribes supposedly betrayed him, and then they suffer the consequences. The third tribe is exiled. Um, so some people can look back to that as a paradigm that if you want to make it, it's not unlike, say, the story of the Jews' mistreatment of Jesus. But that's a bit of a stretch, and it's not as fundamental to the identity of Islam and its prophet as Jesus is, and, what, and that Jesus was living in a Jewish land and walking the earth as a Jew, and not accepted by at least lots of the Jewish community there, and subsequently. So that, there's, there's no getting away from that. We're, and in the Islamic vein, it's, it's an episode. It's not from the center. It's unavoidable. I'm going to ask a question myself. I wonder um, if I can ask a sort of meta question about your talk. Uh, the sources you provided give such a rich sense of this complexity that you're trying to bring out where um, you don't want to reduce the Jewish-Muslim relationship to a, an essence. Um, I'm wondering if you can sort of bring us here to this room and can you say anything about what, what are you, what's the polemical argument? Like who are you arguing against? What's the sort of story or stories that your work um, sort of works to argue against? So, obviously, because we're living in, the, in a world in which conflict in the Middle East is seemingly permanent, although it does have its own ebbs and flows. That's also another, not just another lecture, it's another class. But um, So there are people who, and you can do this, and people do this, another speaker would, could easily come and do it, and cut and paste... Uh, and select only texts that are negative, like the Maimonides one, or like Haiga Owen's poem, that woe is us, look what the Muslims have done to us. This is as terrible as it ever gets. I could just as easily have spoken for an hour highlighting every moment of when there might have been a persecution or every incident 
or every text, uh, Jewish or Muslim, that bespeaks of only tension. And I could convince you, if I'm a decent enough speaker, that, yeah, well, this, it's always better than that. And you'd go if you didn't go and challenge me and read something else or listen to someone else, you would walk away and be convinced. I could also cut and paste and paint the rosiest of rosy pictures. That everything was not just profitable and possible and uh, tolerant and open with always the possibility that something bad might happen. And sometimes some bad things did happen. And the consciousness of being a minority uh, didn't even exist. That they were in a virtual paradise, like the first poem. The Arabs' books, your paradise growth. Well, he's sitting in a library where he's saying that. So if you're a scholar, of course, anybody's books are your paradise growth. So I could cut and paste and, and do that too. And probably it's likely that everyone would say, you know, nothing at all like Christendom. Um, both of those, that's what I'm arguing against. That my job is to find nuance, if there is nuance. I'm not. I shouldn't manufacture it, but if it's there, and since I've been studying all of this for a very long time, I'm always struck by how complex and nuanced the, the picture is. And above all, I have to ask where and when. If someone asks me about a persecution or tension, I want to know where or when. You're talking about Cairo in 1000, or you're talking about Baghdad in 1100, because it could be completely different even though it's part of the same cultural and even political universe. Thank you. OK, we'll do uh, two more questions. I think one of the things that's difficult to get your arms around is, is the length of time that, that Islam and the Jews existed that you're talking about is several hundred years yes. when what we're looking at is a conflict that may be only a hundred years old. And That's it's very and it's, wise. It's imp sort of impossible to grasp the difference in the time And, and frame. we are living in the time of the conflict. So we have no historical perspective on it. Um, and that, ma that makes, and, it's a, and, and political and religious commitments are involved in it. So, you know, it's, historical perspective is great, but when you don't have it, what do you do? Uh, you study history, I guess, and see what you can learn from the history and whether or not it has any bearing on how you might understand the present, even if the bearing isn't direct. But what, what your comments are very, very wise. Okay, we'll do one final question. Thank you. I would just like you to clarify the context in which Maimonides and when Maimonides made the comment that you have quoted behind you. Okay. Uh, to me, it sounds like he's making these comments as a response to a dispute or a conflict. Yeah, he's making an observation. Um, it, it, this actually is in one of his responsa, so it's in a letter, but since he is a rabbinic authority, it carries weight with it. He's making an observation about which language is right for Jews to use in which context. And he's poo -poo He's not interested in the language. He's interested in what the discourse is. So he wants people to live by Torah, but he also wants people to live by, for want of a better term, an intellectual approach to understanding God and God's oneness. And the question of language is of no consequence to him. And in any case, Arabic and Hebrew are the same language. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good evening. I forgot to announce Professor Bram is speaking again tomorrow morning about a more contemporary topic related to World War I. If you haven't registered, you're still welcome to come. Thank you.